that you would direct us, that you would lead us, that you would guide us, and that you would speak to every heart, prepare our hearts for the word of God, as only you can. And we vow to give you praise and glory in the name of Jesus, our Son, your Son, our Lord and King. Amen. So I'm going to look quickly in the book of Luke. I want to talk to you about what child is this? What an awesome Savior we have. We were in Luke last week, Luke chapter 1. Now we're going to be in Luke chapter 2. Now in those days, a decree went forth from Caesar, Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. This was first enrollment made by Quirinius, the governor of Syria. All went to enroll themselves, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David, to enroll himself with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, his wife, as his wife being pregnant. While they were there, the day came forth to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for him in the inn. There were shepherds in the same country, staying in the field and keeping watch by night over their flocks. Behold, an angel of Yahweh stood before them, and the glory of Yahweh shone about them, and they were terrified. And the angel said, Don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all peoples. For unto you today is born in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this is a sign to you, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger or a feeding trough. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly armies praising Yahweh, saying, Glory to Yahweh in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And when the angel went away from them into the sky, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem now and see this thing that has happened, which Yahweh has made known to us. And they came with haste and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. When they saw it, they publicized widely in saying that was spoken to them about the child. All who heard it wondered at these things which were spoken to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising Yahweh for all the things that he had done and that they had heard and seen just as the angel told them. That is a depiction of the birth of our Savior. You can also go into the book of Matthew and find that you see that Jesus came out of the lineage of David. It was prophesied that out of David's family would come the Savior. And Matthew takes it all the way back, 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations, and you see this family line all the way down. But we know one thing about Jesus. He did not have Joseph's DNA. Mary became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Remember what we talked about last week. Joseph was a godly man. He raised Jesus as his own son. But Jesus' father was Yahweh. And you know, the thing that makes Jesus' blood precious was that he had Yahweh's DNA. Nobody else had that. Nobody else had precious blood like that. Could, that could, that Yahweh would accept for the penalty for the sins of mankind. Not even a good man. Not even a million good men, because there's no good men. The Bible, even Jesus, somebody came up to Jesus and said, good master. Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's only one who's good, and that's God. The reason why he said that, of course, he hadn't told him yet, and by the way, <laughs> I am God. Jesus was God, Jesus was man. Jesus was the son of Yahweh. And so, powerful. So I want to talk to you about what child is this? The scripture says, and you shall, there's, this will be a sign to you, you shall find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. 
There was a historian who said, Philip Schaff said, Jesus of Nazareth was without money, without arms. He conquered more millions than Alexander the Great, Caesar Augustus, Napoleon, Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, or Mao Zedong. And there are also three possible reactions to Christ. C.S. Lewis said, you can shut him up as a fool, you can spit at him, and you can kill him, or you can fall at his feet and call him your Lord and your God. You have to say something. You have to make a decision about who Jesus is to you. Now, some people, you'll talk to them and say, who is Jesus to you? Oh, he's a, he was a great teacher. He was a great man. No, he's more than that. But who is he to you? After Jesus had sent his disciples out, he gave them power and authority over demons and told the people to repent of their sins for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When they all came back, they marveled and said, these people, they were amazed. We saw, we cast out demons. We did all these things. And people were calling us rabbi, rabbi, you know, these fishermen. They must have been shocked. Then Jesus said, but who do, you, who do the people say that I am first? And then some said, well, some think that you're John the Baptist returned from the dead. Some people think that you're one of the great prophets. And then Jesus said, who do you say that I am? When we stand before the Lord, that's the question. Who was Jesus to you? Was he your Lord and your savior? Did you surrender your life to him? Did you live your life for him as your Lord and your savior? Because remember, if he's not your Lord, he's not your savior. We all want him to be our savior. We all want to go to heaven. But is he your Lord and your savior? That's so important. And it's not preached enough in churches. But I'm going to tell you about it today. And she brought forth her firstborn, firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. There's still no room for him in people's hearts, sadly. Is there room for him in your heart? Or do you have so much in your heart that you don't have room for him anymore? The reason why they said there was no room for him because they were filled. So maybe your heart is filled with things that you should not have your heart filled with. Sometimes we've got to get rid of that garbage that's in there to make room for him. If somebody was coming to my house, now if you know my wife, this would never be. But if I had like a, an extra bedroom that was full of stuff and somebody was coming to stay in our house, She'd clean the room out, obviously, before they'd come here. Well, now, again, we don't have any extra bedrooms that are full of stuff. I would be killed if I... I have one room in the house. It's the man cave. It's my room. And this lovely lady will come in there. When she talks to me, sometimes I'll be in there, and you can just see her looking around. But it's my man cave, so she pretty much leaves it alone. She doesn't, doesn't visit me. So the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit placed Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Mary was a virgin who became pregnant. That's not a story. It happened. Bless you, dear. The Holy Ghost, he said, shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of Yahweh. But the Son of God, the Son of Yahweh, was not born in a great palace. He was born in poor conditions in a stable. The Bible said he made himself of no reputation, but he took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Isn't that amazing? He left glory like the world has never seen glory. You could take Solomon's temple. You could take Herod's, Herod's temple. And Herod's palace, I guess it is a marvel for people who've gone over and the historian said Herod the first, Herod the Great was a tremendous architect. And, but nothing compares to the glory of heaven and that's where Jesus came from and he did not come down here saying, well, listen, I'm used to eggs benedict. I'm used to the proper things. I'm, no, he came down. We went and saw that the chosen birth uh, Christmas thing one thing that really touched me was, now here's Joseph, he's got Mary, she's great with child, she's going to have a baby any minute now, room for him, and finally someone says, well, there's a stable down there, you can use it, it's not much, but there's dry straw. And so they go in there in this, in this depiction of it, and you know who lives in there is cows and sheep. And so Joseph grabs a shovel and starts scooping up the floor. That's the way it would have been. Jesus was born in a stable 
where ox and cows and sheep lived. I'm sure it didn't smell good, but the son of Yahweh was born in the humblest of places. And then the news that he came was given to the humblest of servants, shepherds out watching their flocks at night. Angels came to shepherds and told them, didn't go to Herod, didn't go to Caesar, but, he went, they, but God sent him to the angel. Gabriel came and told him, I'm sure, because he was the one who told John and, or uh, Zacharias and Mary. He had a busy week, busy year. The place was so humble. Again, wrapped in swaddling clothes. They laid him in a manger or a food box of where the ox ate, donkeys ate from that barn. Matthew Henry says, when we saw him wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger, we're tempted to say, surely this cannot be the son of Yahweh. But see his birth attended with the choirs of angels, and then we should say, surely there can be no one other than the son of Yahweh. That star, I can't wait. When I get to heaven, I'm quite sure, I hope there's a way that I can see the original thing. I would love to be able to, hey, do you got a video archive up here? <laughs> I'd like to see it. I'd like to see the star. And once I'm up there, I won't want to see the crucifixion. But I'd sure see, love, love to see his birth. But I'll be there. And he'll reach out that hand with that nail print. And he'll wrap it around me and hug me and welcome me home. But I want to see that star. I want to see what it says. But see his attendees. Who, who, who knew about this? Angels knew about it. A newborn baby wrapped in swaddling clothes being placed in a manger. Even poor shepherds had never seen a baby laid in a feeding trough for a donkey. In their poor conditions, I'm sure they probably never saw that before. When a lamb... Now here's what's so important. We, the thing on the chosen, they said that uh, swaddling clothes was something they did when lambs were born because they did not have enough wool yet. So they'd wrap them and keep them warm. But I began to study that a little bit and I found a different meaning. What swaddling clothes was, when a lamb was selected to be sacrificed to Yahweh, they would pick one that was without spot or without wrinkle and they would wrap that one in swaddling clothes to keep it from any infection and getting any imperfection on it. So here is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, wrapped in swaddling clothes like a lamb that was going to be offered as a sacrifice. That's what that means. And Isaiah spoke that hundreds of years before our Lord came. That blesses my heart. This shall be a sign to you. Come to Bethlehem and see him whose Birth the angels sing, come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn King. See him in the manger laid, Lord of heaven and earth. Mary Joseph, lend your aid with us, sing our Savior's birth. Hark the herald angels sing, nobody knows, or angels we have heard on high, nobody knows who wrote that. Author unknown. I got a feeling. I know somebody who had a, a part in it. Jesus came down from the glory of heaven to be born in a stable, stable and placed in a dirty straw trough for cattle to eat. He made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant in the likeness of man. And being fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the death of the cross. The Bible says, cursed is everyone who dies upon the tree. And remember, he, who know, he knew no sin. Jesus never sinned. He was tempted. Being around people, I'm sure he was quite tempted because people are stupid. I'm sure he, they drove him crazy. I'm sure they said things, did things. It's like, oh, how long? He even said it a few times. How long do I have to put up with you people? Don't you guys get it yet? But he never sinned. He never sinned. The son of Yahweh, the Lord of creation, was born in a stable as a man. And he lived his life in poverty. And he was stripped naked and nailed to a cross. The thing that always gets me at Christmas time, and I don't think about it just at Christmas time. I always think about it when I hold my little grandson Ellis there or any babies. I always, I, hands, 
marvel. I marvel at hands. The way that we have hundreds of bones in these little hands, and even babies have them. But when I look at those little hands, and I try to think to myself, I wonder if Mary, knowing that he was come to save the world from sin, I don't know that she knew how terrible that was going to look. But her little baby boy, whose hands you look at, you know, we checked their grip. That somewhere right about here in the future, there was going to be a large Roman nail spiked. Not in the hand. The hand wouldn't hold it. The weight of the hand would have ripped out. The nail would have ripped his hand right off. But here, there's these bones here that would hold the weight. Can you imagine? And then here. And in his feet. Now, I can tell you because of my previous training, this is a pressure point. If I grab you on your wrist the right way, it hurts really, really bad. If I stomp the top of your foot, you're going to be hurting for a long time. And they put those nails right through those pressure points. The suffering of our Lord must have been tremendous. And this is what we're celebrating today, that that Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world came into the world, but he came into the world as a baby. He came into the world in such humility. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, for we, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. What does that mean? That means when you are a born-again Christian, when you've surrendered your life to Christ, even if your bank account says zero, you are rich. And you have things the world does not have. That's why Jesus came in poverty. He didn't have to come as a king. He is the king. Gold does not make you a king. Your position with God makes you a king. When you have peace in your heart, when you can lay your head upon your pillow at night and go to sleep and you're not worrying about this and you're not worrying about that, you know your sins are forgiven, you know heaven is your destiny, you're rich. Because this world is filled with people that are afraid to die. They're afraid of what, what comes next. I'm not. I know what comes next. Because what Jesus did on the cross, because he's risen, so will the believers in Christ will also rise. That's the good news. He not only paid for our sins on the cross, but then he also, because he conquered death, we conquer death. Good news. What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Why lies he in such mean a state where ox and ass are feeding? Whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch our keeping. That was written in 1837 between... Amazing. What child is this? Now turn to John chapter 1. Go to John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the Word. Jesus was the Word. He is the Word. And it says, All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Look up the phrase, the Word. Jesus is the second person in the Trinity. Now, Jesus is not Yahweh, and Yahweh is not Jesus. Jesus is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not Jesus. But they are one. They're one. Hard for us to figure out because we have limited minds. But He created the world. All things were made through Him. That's what the Word says. Pretty amazing. Why did Jesus come? Because Yahweh sent him to die on the cross. Can you imagine? I cannot imagine sending one of my children to die for this lot. And I'm included. Yet he, he did. And Jesus did it. He was a man. When he was the garden, the night of the garden before he was to be crucified, he knew the suffering was coming. Crucifixion was no mystery. 
people knew what crucifixion was in those days. Of course, what they did to our master was way worse than what they did to most people. They didn't flog everyone like they flogged Jesus. Most people would have died through the flogging alone. But he knew what was coming. And that night before he was in the garden and he went off to pray and he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But then he said, nevertheless, thy will be done. That's what we need to learn from him. Sometimes life is difficult, but if you know it's the will of Yahweh, then you need to go, go through it. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten son of the father, full of grace and truth. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That is the incarnation, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, who was made flesh in the womb of Mary, who made the world. He who made the world was born in a stable in Bethlehem. He who made the world, there was no room for the world for him in their inns. It just blows me away. And the word became flesh. The word of, word of the Father now in flesh appearing. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. You know what I find amazing? And I never even thought about it till this very minute. Why did he send the shepherds? Because they were humble. They were lowly. And in order for us to worship Jesus Christ as Lord, we need to humble ourselves. We need to come humble. That's why he didn't call Herod's army to come out. He didn't call Julius Caesar. Tell him, I'll bring all the Roman high, high people. There's a king coming into the world who's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He didn't do that. He called shepherds. People, we need to approach him humbly. When you're dealing with Yahweh, when you're dealing with Jesus, you've got to humble yourselves. He is awesome. I don't have to, you know, when I compare myself to him, it's really easy to humble myself. But sometimes we get in our heads that we're better than we are. We think we're something we're not. When you compare yourselves to, to Yahweh, people, there is no standing up proud. He's worthy. He's holy. He's Awesome. Jesus came down from heaven to the earth. He did not come the way everybody expected him. You know, when, when Jesus came and he made the statement that, that he was the Messiah, people had a hard time because they thought the Messiah was going to come on a white charger, a horse, and defeat the Romans. That's not what he did. He came with a whole different message. He didn't come to set us free from the Romans. He came to set us free from sin. He came to set us free from ourselves, from Satan. He didn't come the way. And oftentimes, God does not come in a way that you think. His ways are not our ways, people. Humble yourself. And when you humble yourself, you'll find yourself hearing more from him. If you're an arrogant Christian, get ready for a dry season because you ain't going to hear nothing. God does not speak. Remember something. Humble Christians are used by God. Prideful Christians use God. Which one are you? He did not come as a great earthly king. He came as a little baby. He was born in the lowest condition. They laid him in straw. And the virgin shall give birth. And she will wrap him in swaddling clothes and lie him in a manger. This shows that Jesus was fully human. Jesus was fully human. Mary, a human, was holding him and nursing Emmanuel. <laughs> Blows me away. The poor and lonely birth of Jesus in the stable foreshadowed his humiliating and lowly death. They arrested him for preaching the truth. They blindfolded him and beat him with their hands. And they said, prophesy, who hit you? This baby in a manger when he grew up. They spit on him. They pulled out great chunks of his beard. They nearly beat him to death with the whip. They stripped off all his clothes until he was naked and they stuck him on the tree on the cross. 
and he hung there dying between two criminals who were crucified, one on each side that was prophesied. If you want a full description of this horrible death, go to Mark chapter 15, 16 through 20, but you don't have to go there now. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called the Praetorium, and they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple robes, and they plaited a crown of thorns on his head, thorns like that. And they pushed him down into his head. There's something called the Shroud of Turin out there. Many people think there's nothing to it. I personally do. I actually read a, I read a forensic, they did a forensic autopsy on the Shroud. The person in the Shroud, the dating is correct from the time of Jesus. The person in the Shroud, you see this person would have been wrapped, this whole person was wrapped, his hands were across like this, his feet were uncovered. You could see the person in the shroud had holes in his wrists. He had holes in his feet. And you can also see, because the shroud goes around the whole body, that the back, the back of the legs was ripped. Flesh just ripped off him. You could also see in the shroud that the crown of thorns was not a crown more, it was a cap, covered his whole head. And you could see where there was remnant of blood and pus because those thorns brought infection right away. I'm not trying to be grotesque, but I want you to know what he did for you. I want you to know that the baby who was laid humbly in a manger also died humbly as a criminal, yet he was no criminal. The word of God says to us that he who knew no sin became sin for us. And do you know, as the master was hanging there, and you know why you die? You know how you die from crucifixion? You suffocate. You're hanging there. The, your body weight, and you, you get to where you can't breathe. What they normally do is if they, the Romans want to leave you there, they'll come and break your legs so that you can't even try to hold your weight anymore, and you will suffocate. But the prophets declared that they would break none of his bones when they came to Jesus, they found he was already dead, but somebody took a spear, put it right into his side, into his heart, and the word tells us that blood ran out until only water came out. He spent every drop of blood, every drop of blood, and that little baby that Mary held came to shed his blood for Mary, for Joseph, for the shepherds, for Caesar, for Herod, for us, for all of us. This is why he did what he did. They mocked him. They nailed his hands and feet to the cross. And we know the rest of the story. Jesus was not born just to give you a Christmas tree in twinkling lights. Christmas isn't about Santa Claus. Got any kids up here? Christmas is about Jesus. He was born to die. That's why he came. So I want you to realize today during this Christmas season, the reason why he came, the reason that he lived, the reason that he taught, the reason that he did miracles. You know, he did miracles. He would see someone who was blind and he'd open their eyes. He's still opening blind eyes today. I'm praying that somebody's eyes would be open in this room today. There's a lot of people in this room that are blind. But I don't think any of you got a walking cane. But there are people that are spiritually blind, and he, he still opens those eyes. But he also still opens natural eyes. I believe in all the power of God. I believe he can do anything he wants to. So the question today for you is, he is now ascended at the right hand of the Father. He's up there now in heaven making intercession for us. That's why I pray in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name. And Jesus is sitting right next to the Father. Hey, Dad. Yahweh, Father. And Jesus starts interceding for me. He intercedes for us. That's what the Word says. You can bow down before Him today just like the shepherds did. 
Can you imagine being a shepherd who was just told that a savior is born in the city of David and you'll find him and the shepherds walk in and see that baby? I bet you they got on their faces. They just saw an angel announcing it. They saw multitudes of angels. They're the only people that we know of that has ever heard a heavenly choir because they were humble. You want to hear heaven? Humble yourself. Will you come and trust Christ as the son of Yahweh today? Will you be saved by him from sin, death, and the grave? Will you receive eternal life from him? This is all what Jesus came for. He came to save you. And I don't care if you're 12, 18, 21, 75, 98. He came to save you. If you've not yet given your life to Jesus Christ, and I'm not just talking about raising your hand and saying, okay, I'm saved. I'm talking about giving him your life. Best as you know how. Lord, I don't know how to do it. Ask him. Show me how. Show me how. I don't know how. 36 years ago, I was 35 years or whatever it was. I did not want to become a Christian. It wasn't my plan. I was living like the world lives. Smoking a lot of dope. Going through a lot of cocaine. Meth. In those days, it was crystal meth. Stupid. But Yahweh called me. And even though I ran from that call, I couldn't run any longer. He's calling some of you today. It's time for you guys to give your lives to him. It's time for you to surrender to him. You're not gonna know the joy that I know until you have this encounter with heaven through the person of Jesus Christ. And that's my prayer for you today. Believe on him. Will you believe on him? The word says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. But you need to believe on him fully. Will you trust him with your life? Will you be saved by him? I pray that you will. In the old days, when people became missionaries, and I'm talking old days where they had ships that only had sails, if you were called to go to Africa or China, you would say goodbye to your family and you would never see them again. They just, they didn't travel like we do today. The reason why I say that is because when you give your life to Jesus, you need to give your life to Christ and that's it. Even though you can go to China and come back, it's the same. I feel like when he saved me, he just wants me to tell people now. So whether we're all here or I'm talking to somebody one-on-one -on -one at the store, it doesn't make any difference. If you bump into me, I'm gonna tell you about the Lord because I don't want you, not that I don't think you deserve hell or I don't think I, don't, I deserve hell. I do, we all do, you know. But I want you to know the mercy and the grace of Yahweh that he sent his son Jesus and I want you to know that it's his will that you be saved. Hey, we made it almost all the way to the end. Pretty good. O oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O oh, come ye, O oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. That's why we come here to celebrate Christmas. We come to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ because he's the savior of the world. Is he your savior? If you want to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you say, well, I don't really know what I'm doing. I didn't either. I still don't know what I'm doing. But I will say this to you today. If the Holy Spirit has been speaking to your heart, you know I'm telling you the truth. Even if you don't want to do it, some people, I've had people walk out of here, well, I don't want to hear this, okay. I hope you do someday. But some of you in this room, as I've been speaking, the Holy Spirit's been pulling on your hearts. Somebody said to me recently, one thing about Pastor Steve, I don't like all his messages, but I know he's telling the truth. I'll take that. I'm not here to make you happy. I'm here to tell you the truth. I'm throwing out life preservers. And some of you are treading water in an ocean. You can only tread for so long. So if you want to know Christ as your Lord and Savior today, what does that mean? You need to just tell him, Lord, I'm so sorry for the life I've lived. Please forgive me. 
for the life I've lived. Not only do I want you to forgive me, I want you to give me an, a new heart, give me a new mind. I want, to give, I want to change my life. I want to live for you. I want to serve you the rest of my days. And whatever that looks like, whether I live for a day or I live for a hundred years, whether I'm honored or I'm persecuted, I'll serve you, whatever you want, because you're my Lord and you're my Savior. I don't have any say-so anymore. If you would like to give Jesus your heart today, just right where you're at, I'd like everyone just to close your eyes and pray for the people that are making decisions today. If you want to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I just ask you to put your hand up. Just let the Lord see you. Lord, help me. Lord, save me. Forgive me of my sins. I'm so sorry for the life I've lived. I want to live my life for you the rest of my days. Come into my heart and change me. Make me the man, make me the woman you've called me to be. I so thank you for dying on the cross for me, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Yahweh, for giving your very best for me. Forgive me. I repent of my sins, which means I go 180 degrees the other way from this point on. Give me the strength to live a godly life for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I believe right now that some names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what the Bible says. You know, the apostles were, were healing the sick. All these things were going on and they were telling people, man, we were healing the sick. And they were excited. Jesus said, don't be excited about that. You should be excited that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And if your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're one of his. And I thank God for that. Now we're going to have communion. So if everyone would just stay still, uh, they're going to bring the communion around. What we did last week,